All right, hello, good morning, period two. Welcome to philosophy, uh, first ever Zoom lecture. How's everyone doing? Uh, great. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's Tiffany, there's the, the raise hand function button. No, I'm not raising my hand. Oh, sorry, uh, Tiffany uh, uh, B. Tiffany, bruh. I know, yeah. It'll be harder. Yes, I know, it's gonna get a little uh, confusing. We'll, we'll do our best, I promise. Um, oh, hey, Cisco, good morning. Uh, okay, then I'm going to share my screen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen and then we'll get started right away. So again, you might want to take something to uh, uh, take notes. Um, oh, you might also want to have the reading because we're going to go over one passage. That's why I told you to download uh, the PDF from Schoology if you haven't already. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can everyone see, oh, no. can everyone see this? Docile bodies? Can everyone see it? Yeah. Okay, oh, yikes, what the heck? Okay, all right, Whew. we're good. In the world. Okay, docile bodies. So today is April 1st. Uh, I know a lot of us kind of wish that we could just kind of wake up and think, oh, haha, it was just a prank, bro. Uh, you can go back to school now. Oh, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, quick digression to, I actually really, really um, uh, am, am regretful that I was never able to do an April Fool's prank with your class. Uh, the last time April Fool's landed on a school day was actually when you guys were in eighth grade. Uh, and uh, Mr. LeConte and I were actually talking about that yesterday, and we thought like, oh, to, you know, this year we're finally going to plan a big prank, and then, you know, this happened, so <laughs> yikes. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Today's homework is just to read up to page 20, so just three little pages of reading, and then do discussion board number 10. Uh, the next lecture for you guys will be on, uh, shoot, not until next Monday <laughs> at 10.30. So uh, again, there will not be any additional homework, just whatever is given uh, in terms of a lecture. Oh, and by the way, if you ever feel like I'm giving too much work or, or too little work, um, I would always appreciate any kind of feedback you can give me. So you can just stay a few minutes and chat after class on Zoom, or you can just shoot me an email, whatever is more, uh, whatever is preferable to you. Okay, is everyone ready? Give me some indication or sign that you're ready. I'm ready. All right, Jessica. I'm ready. Okay, all right, here we go. Our docile bodies are ready. Here we go. <laughs> okay. I didn't get a chance to do this with the other lectures because the nature of the YouTube lectures was, you know, obviously there's just so many of you, but I think in a little, slightly more intimate setting, I can uh, kind of review uh, the discussion board from Monday. So I asked, which do you think is a more humane punishment, a public execution or a timetable and why? So uh, let's start with that. So let's go ahead and review the, uh, um, <clears throat> the discussion board. Uh, let's start with Jaden. Jaden, go ahead. Um, I said that like, uh, the timetable has to be more uh, humane because like that's pretty close to what we do now so like if we're to like even operate in our current society we just have to kind of accept that the timetable is more humane okay so you would say that the timetable is more humane because and it's, and it's what we tend to do like so obviously we have a bias in our society for a timetable okay yeah no, and then that's a good point. Although, kind of devil's advocate, just because we do it, like it doesn't necessarily mean it's more humane. But, 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 but I, I see what you're saying. Um, Tiffany, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> I think the execution is more humane because it's fast. It like gets the job done fast. And also, um, well, like putting someone in prison and then like expecting them to have a normal life after or just keeping them in like, a confined area, like torturing them for the rest of their life, is not humane. Okay, so so you, so you would consider it to be inhumane anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's fair. Uh, so already we have two different points of view. I like that. Uh, Cisco, I see your hand. Yeah, I would say that um, for the, from the perspective of the prisoner, uh, then the more humane option would be the timetable because then they don't die and they they can still have some freedom of choice and thought because they're not dead. But from the perspective of the whole society, since you can't see what happens behind bars, that whole thing about like resisting and uh, having like sympathy with the prisoner kind of goes away because you don't see it. So for the society, it's kind of less humane. Okay, totally. Uh, again, another valid point of view. I mean, when you think about it, we don't really know what happens behind closed doors, you know, behind the closed walls of a prison. And so it's very possible that maybe it is uh, less humane than just, you know, outright killing someone. Although Cisco brings up a good point. I mean, what would you prefer personally if you were a prisoner? Would you prefer to just be publicly executed and just done? Or would you prefer to be put on this very strict timetable for 
what could be years. Jessica. Time table. Why? Because I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, again, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, wait, 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 we going to add to that, or, or is this kind of the argument? I, I, I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah. All right, fair. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of us have this idea, like, well, if you're dead, then that's it. Like, there's no freedom, there's no more choice, like, period, full stop. Whereas if you're in a timetable, there's always a little bit of like, you know, leeway and a little bit of freedom and at least you're alive. Um, okay, that's fair. I think what Foucault would say is that they're both very cruel, but just in different ways. And he would never advocate like, oh yeah, guys, let's go back to the guillotine. Nah, that's not what Foucault is about. Foucault was not in favor of public executions. He just wanted us to admit that timetables could be very cruel and inhumane as well. So this is kind of a trick question. It, it's not really one being more humane than the other. Foucault would argue that they're both very inhumane, just in different ways. Um, and again, you're entitled to your own opinions. I just want you to critically think about what Foucault would say about this. Now, in my opinion, the more important question is actually the second one. What's the purpose behind a public execution and a timetable? Because I would argue they have the same purpose, ultimately. What's, what, what's, what's, this, what's the purpose? So everyone answer at once. Well, they all have the same purpose. And I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the lecture from yesterday. Look at the title. Discipline. Thank you, Jaden. That's precisely right. The one key word. Discipline. It's to maintain discipline. A public execution is supposed to maintain discipline. A timetable is supposed to maintain discipline. Now, which do you think ultimately is more effective? The timetable. Enrique, you're definitely right. The timetable is far more effective, we've discovered. A timetable is way more effective at keeping discipline in order, which is what we're going to get into today. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I haven't had a chance to read through all of your responses yet uh, for the discussion board, but I will be doing that uh, very soon. I actually uh, feel like I have more grading now during this quarantine than I did during a normal school uh, session. It really sucks, so whatever. Okay, so yes, the answer was discipline. And in particular, there's a couple of key components of discipline that we'll be going over in the next few lessons. Okay, specifically, the big overview of the rest of this unit for me is going to be disciplinary power and techniques of normalization. For Foucault, Foucault actually had like, a, it's almost like a, like, a, like a guidebook, how to discipline somebody. Step one, docile bodies, that's today's lesson. Step two, the means of correct training, that's next week's lesson. Step three, panopticism, also next week's lesson. And then finally, creating an other, that'll be the week after that. Um, so Foucault almost has like a step-by-step -step process of how you are disciplined in a society, how you are programmed to behave in a particular way. So again, I will be making this PowerPoint available like as a PDF once we're done with it, and I am going to put this lecture up on YouTube later. So everyone good? Sick. Cool. Here we go. <laughs> um, that's the focus for today docile bodies. And it's not like in a weird way. It's, uh, well, you're going to see, it, it's, it, it basically boils down to this. Foucault is going to make the claim that the first step to disciplining someone is you have to control their physical body, like where they are, what they're doing, physically keeping them in line. Because you can't convince someone to behave well unless you have them controlled in a particular space and time. So in order to illustrate that, We have a little thought experiment today. Did the sound effect work? Did the sound effect work? Oh yeah, it worked. I can't hear you. It worked. Yes. Are you sure? Yeah. Maybe try it like three more times. Did you try it like another time? No, yeah, it definitely works. Demonstrate it, Mr. Fuentes. Ah, I can't do it, my voice isn't that high. Anyway, okay, I have a scenario for you. <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk about it together. <laughs> okay. Thought experiment, spoiled brat. Imagine that you are a parent, heaven forbid. Let's assume that you, like most reasonable parents, obviously want your kid to behave and be good. One day, you take your child to the supermarket and they start to throw a terrible tantrum because you refuse to get them the cereal they wanted. They start screaming and throwing food items on the floor. The scene is getting so bad that people are starting to stare. What do you do and why? Answer thoroughly and think about the implications of discipline. Okay, so you have your pretty mundane, like, you know, temper tantrum. Let's say it's a young child. Um, you're the parent. 
what do you do to discipline your child, essentially? Uh, think, and think about how this relates back to Foucault. So how do you get your kid to stop throwing this horrible tantrum? Uh, I'll give you a second. I'll give you a second to think about it. And uh, obviously, I think your answer is going to be painted by the way that you were raised. But uh, but let's hear it. Um, go ahead and uh, 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 Tiffany Warner. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, you can like punish them. Obviously, like there's a certain like when you're younger, you get to learn what is like right and what is wrong basically through conditioning. So like if you're like given a reward for like doing something, then like congrats, you're doing the right thing. But if you're punished, then you start to learn that like, okay, I shouldn't do this. Okay, so punishing. Uh, although we'll, we'll get into the specifics of what kind of punishment in a bit. Uh, <laughs> Julia, go ahead. Um, I would say that like first like talk to them and then if they keep doing it, like remove them from the situation. So the first step would be talk to them, try to reason with them. And then if they still don't behave, then physically remove them from the situation. Yeah. Okay, All right. good steps, good steps. Uh, Eric, go ahead. Per personally, my strategy, I would just leave the kid and just walk away. Like, I mean, they're throwing the tantrum so that they get attention from me, but they ain't going to get it. I'll just leave them, you know? So, so, so in your opinion, they throw a tantrum because they, what they really want is attention, and so you deny them that attention. Yeah, like, oh, get me the, get me the thing. I ain't going to do that. You can do this all you want. I'm not going to be a part of it. Okay, so, so you would just literally, like, if you're, like, in one of the aisles in the supermarket, you would just leave the aisle. Yeah. Interesting strategy. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, Tiffany B. and then Jess uh, G. Um, I think this falls under the category of, like, I guess, talking to them, but this, I, I think this is a method for some parents who have patients and also don't have patience. And so they would like, I guess, bribe their kids with candy or something, toys, or buying them something. So like negotiating, I guess. Okay, so so I guess you could end up trying to negotiate by getting them candy or maybe just getting them what they want. Yeah. Okay, what do you guys think about that? Would you, would you end up getting, just getting them the cereal to get them to shut up? Well, either my kid, right? Yes, they're, they're your child. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> well, okay. Oh, uh, 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 Jaden, got to raise your hand just so we can keep an order here. Oh, wait, uh, uh, Jess, I, I know I said you're next, but let me get Cisco in on this, and then I'll, then I'll have you answer. Uh, Cisco, uh, in order to answer that directly? Yeah, uh, well, if you just give them what they want, then it enables that behavior. So you definitely cannot do that. That would be like if a criminal stole something, and you're like, okay, here's another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. you would only encourage that behavior. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Uh, Jessica, then Jaden? Okay, so you know how the shopping carts, they have the little seats? Yes. I would just get my child and put my child in that seat. Because then oh. they won't be able to reach the aisles and start throwing things. They might still be loud, but at least they're, like, contained and not, like, you know. So, so, so physically uh, moving the child, and so in a sense, controlling their body, in a sense. Yeah. Okay, all right. No, th th that might be a worthwhile strategy, yeah. Uh, uh, Jaden and then Hannah. Oh, I lowered my hand. Oh. Cisco said what I was going to say. Thank you, though. <laughs> Hannah. <laughs> Hannah Eisenberg. Yeah, sorry. I had to unmute myself. Um, I feel like you have to use negative reinforcement to, like, discipline them in a way, just so, like, they learn that if they act this way, like, they're only going to, like, lose things rather than gain them. Okay, so, so there has to be a negative reinforcement in order to try and discourage this kind of behavior. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's fair. Uh, okay, just to kind of shift the conversation a little bit, uh, I've noticed no one here has so far advocated for uh, physical punishment. Uh, do you think that that might be effective or a threat of physical punishment? Like, when you get home, you're really going to get it. I, I, I'm seeing a few heads shaking, no? Uh, just, uh, just getting in, Tiffany. Um, that's, like, traumatic. <laughs> traumatic punishment to be publicly like like hit or anything like that so I'm definitely off the table for my child and me so yeah. okay so and I'm, and I'm not talking about child abuse right now okay I'm just talking about like 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 spanking or uh or something like that but but you would say like no definitely not off the table for you okay all right that's fair oh hey Sophia good morning uh okay Tiffany go ahead no just like no I'm sorry but like there's like, 
a time and a place for like using like so physically but, like if your child's throwing a temper tantrum you're just gonna like make them just, like what <laughs> what the fuck why are you hitting me like I'm, I'm just trying to get what I want and you're being kind of a bummer right now like it's gonna make your child like resent you I feel like if you like actually act physically on them okay so you would say physical punishment no no okay all right uh Enrique and then Jaden um, I, I think, I think at the moment it would be effective because if the child gets hit or something, then they just, just shut up and just listen to the parent. But I think over time they become like desensitized to it and like lose that discipline. So like in the long run, it wouldn't be effective. Okay. So in the short run, you can kind of threaten them and scare them to do what you want. But in the long run, it might not, because they don't understand why what they're doing. Like that. Yeah. Okay, no, that's fair. Um, and, and maybe, you know, I, I've often heard this, is uh, if you train a child not to do something just through punishment, especially physical punishment, then all they learn is just to avoid punishment, not what they did was bad. Yeah. Uh, Jaden, go ahead. Yeah, I was just like, because we're kind of on the topic of like negative reinforcement as a whole. And I feel like with t temper tantrums, it's actually, it's easier to use negative reinforcement. But I feel like in general, positive reinforcement, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a parent, but it, I feel like it tends to work a lot of, and, and you can even be worse to a child through verbal abuse than the physical abuse. I mean, we're, that's the nth degree, but even with that, like, but if you are able to, like, qualm a situation using positive reinforcement, like teaching the kid that they're worth something and that like an action is better than another action rather than just to avoid the punishment i think is actually more effective okay and again and explaining it to them yeah exactly that's fair you know no one has has yet uh and i'm kind of surprised but no one here has said a very common strategy um who here thinks a good strategy might be to uh shame the child like to like, you're like, wow, look at all these people looking at you. Like, wow, people, you know, uh, good kids don't behave this way. You know, good boys, good girls don't behave this way. Uh, nobody's mentioned that yet, but do you think shame could be an effective strategy of discipline? I, I did Julia, I see like, uh. <laughs> Julia, go ahead. I would say like, definitely not because I feel like that's really traumatic and that could just lead to like a bad relationship between you two. Between the parent and child. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, well uh, but I mean, when you think about, I mean, uh, I, you don't have to answer this, but I want you to reflect back on the way that you guys were raised. Uh, what kind of techniques did your parents use to discipline you? Did they just, uh, uh, you know, because my, my mom, you know, she would get the chancla if I like, you know, behave badly. Uh, but then they don't speak Spanish. That's like the sandal. Uh, <laughs> and so, but then some of you, maybe your parents shamed you. Maybe some of you just kind of your parents let you do what you want. Maybe that explains a lot. Um, and so I, I just want you to, you know, consider that. Uh, oh, Victoria, you have a hand? Yeah, so, like, I have a little sister, and, um, like, my parents have tried, like, doing that, like, telling her that, like, there are people watching her and stuff, and it doesn't work. Like, if someone, if, like, a toddler or someone is set on something, they, like, don't care. I don't know. That's from, like, my experiences with my sister, so. Interesting, interesting. Okay. All right, so the purpose of, and by the way, this thought experiment is actually today's discussion board. So I would like you to answer this, you know, pretty thoroughly and try to apply Foucault to this. But essentially what Foucault is going to say, and, and uh, though that order that we're going to go in, docile bodies, the means of correct training, panopticism, and the other, he says is actually the most efficient way to discipline someone, and that would include disciplining a child. So the very first thing you have to do is control their body. So you have to get them to like, for instance, stop trashing the aisle uh, in the supermarket or you have to like basically get them to do what you, you have to get them to go where you want them to go. So for instance, uh, when Eric was talking about like, you know, just leaving the aisle, 99% of kids will then freak out and go look for their parent. Uh, and so in a sense, you do kind of force them to then do what you want. You, you, you control the, the physical movement of their body. So it's just an interesting question. It's a very interesting thought experiment. I just kind of wanted to present it to you guys to, uh, you know, to get you to start thinking about it. Uh, okay, so again, uh, we'll return to it later, and we'll actually debrief it um, next Monday when we meet again. But it, it's, an, it's an interesting thought experiment. Uh, okay, and again, if you haven't had a chance to participate yet, don't worry, there's plenty of opportunities in this presentation. Okay, so again, let's start with this. So we're talking about discipline, and, 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 and that question with, the, with, your, with your child um, is just a, a way to get you to start thinking about uh, discipline and the nature of discipline. 
So today's lesson is going to be focusing on the first part, a docile body, or how to create a docile body. Oh, a uh, personal question, but just uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so curious. Uh, how many of you would one day like to be parents? Oh, a handful of you? Okay. A few of you? Okay. Anyone here like, absolutely not? Like, nope, no way. <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, your opinions can change as time goes on. But I'm, I'm, I'm always curious, like, uh, where teenagers are at. Like, do you guys want kids? Because like, obviously not now, I hope. But like, in the future, right? Uh, um, uh, is that something that you'd be uh, willing to do? Um, I don't know, just, just, just uh, me being nosy, I guess. Okay, well, anyway, back to docile bodies. What oh. about you, bro? <laughs> oh, one day. I think I'd make a very good father. Uh, yeah, I'd agree. <laughs> but honestly, like, just keeping track of you guys is more than enough right now. <laughs> All right, docile bodies. So Foucault pointed out, that forms a discipline that used to be common only in places like monasteries, armies, and workshops were becoming increasingly normal in all aspects of modern life. So he pointed out, like, uh, for instance, like an old, like, medieval monastery, you know, this very regimented, very secluded, very, like, timetable-oriented way of life, that used to be not the norm. That used to be um, something that only monks would do, or, you know, the regimented way that an army is run, or uh, the way that, like, an old workshop was run highly regimented, on a timetable, super disciplined. Foucault pointed out that used to be like abnormal, but now it's becoming increasingly normal. I mean, we have timetables and schedules in pretty much all aspects of work, in school. Why do you think they put us on this block schedule, folks? Seriously, why do you think they put us on this block schedule? Why do you think they're forcing you to wake up at like nine in the morning? One word, starts with a D. Discipline. Discipline. Oh, there you go. There's the chorus. Yes. Discipline. Language. Yeah, also that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> discipline. It's to maintain discipline. Uh, and look, I guess I want to take a quick break here. Foucault is very critical and very negative. He says that this is bad. Like he was, he was an outspoken critic against this. He thought that it is bad to take away personal freedom from people. However, I want you to critically evaluate it. Maybe Foucault is right. And maybe this is a bad thing. But could discipline also be a good thing? I mean, for instance, if you have a disciplined sleeping schedule, it's proven that you sleep better. And if you actually wake up at like a reasonable hour and go to bed at a reasonable hour, like you feel healthier and more alert and you're more productive. So isn't that better? <laughs> just something to think about, just something to think about. So Foucault, as, as the historian, points out, okay, what used to be common in only these very regimented forms of life, you know, monasteries, the army, workshops, are now in every aspect of our lives, especially school. I mean, I know right now is very, you know, not a good example of being in school, but even still, I mean, we're in a timetable. And when you were in school, the bell rings and your body shuffles out to the next class or to, you know, your, your designated hangout spot. And the bell rings again, and then you go to the next spot. Like, you're very well trained when you think about it in that way. Your body is not your own, says Foucault. Think about it. You are often told where to stand, when to go, where you can go, where you can't go, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, nowhere is that more obvious than now during a quarantine. <laughs> more than that, however, there are tiny details in your everyday routine that treat you and your body, here's the big metaphor, as nothing more than a machine. Okay, so it seems very obvious, again, in the time of quarantine, you know, you're being explicitly told where you can go, where you can't go. But even in a normal day, like, uh, if, if we were in school, if we were in E1 right now, I would point out uh, the, uh, to, the, to the, the windows with the, with the grills on them. Uh, it's quite literally like a prison. And, you know, a high school is fenced in, you know, there's all these gates everywhere. Uh, and a lot of you will think like, oh, when I go to college, it'll be different. You're right, because most colleges don't have physical barriers like fences or whatever. But it doesn't matter because uh, the fences are also metaphorical. We'll go over that next lesson. But okay, I want to stick with that metaphor though, machine. You are treated like a machine. Let me ask you a question. You guys treat machines a certain way, differently than you would a human being. How would you treat, let's say, your, um, your phone or your computer? How would you treat your phone or computer differently than a human being? Like, what's the difference? Like, you don't, oh, I'm not raising my hand, never mind. 
Is, uh, uh, some decorum, some decorum, folks. Raise your hand. What's the difference between the way you would treat a machine like a computer or a phone versus the way that you treat a human being? Uh, again, I appreciate your participation, uh, Tiffany, but, but I, I want to give other people an opportunity. Maybe Ben, Josh, Chloe, Sabrina, Karen, Sid, Ashley. Come on, think about it. Think about what, what are some big differences between the way we treat humans versus the way that we treat machines? Okay, Tiffany B. I mean, for one, with phones, um, if it does crack, we usually do replace them. Unlike like human beings, if they get sick, you put them in hospital hospitals or like find help for them. Basically. Okay, well, that, well, that's a good point. I mean, machines are, are more thought of to be replaceable, so that, that's one difference. Good, uh, Sydney. Um, yeah, like when my phone is like being slow or something, like I just get like really annoyed. Like its its sole purpose is like to do the task that I want it to do. And when it's not doing it, it's like, well, then what are you, what is it here for? Very good. Precisely. Uh, by the way, do you guys see my, like my face, like my window? Cause I'm doing a lot of gestures. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> anyway, Sydney, very, very good response. That's right. We expect machines to fulfill a very specific purpose or function. And when they don't, we think they're broken. They need to be fixed. Human beings, we understand, have free will and they have a consciousness. So we don't necessarily treat them in the same way. But when you treat someone like a machine, you treat them as if they have one function and they have to fulfill that function. If they don't fulfill that function, they are somehow defective or, or broken and need to be corrected. That's the big difference. Like if your phone's not turning on, you immediately try to troubleshoot. Like, okay, did I forget to charge it? Uh, is, 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 did I drop it? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And we tend to treat people in much the same way, says Foucault. Our institutions do not treat you like a human being. They treat you like a machine. A machine? Let me explain. By the way, I'm really proud of this graphic, so I'll just drink it in for a second. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so in what way are you like a machine? Um, let me explain. And I can actually explain with a very specific example. Now, imagine an institution like school to be like a factory. And its whole purpose is not to teach you. A school's purpose is not to teach you. It's, it's not even really to socialize you. It's, it's to turn you into a machine. Everything else is secondary. The primary purpose of any institution, educational, religious, governmental, is to turn you into a machine, uh, something, that they, a, 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 something that they want you to be. Let me explain with a very specific example. Let's talk about the army. Let's talk about soldiers. So soldiers, in the past, Foucault says, there was a very specific view of the kind of person that would be a soldier. They were almost always men, uh, and they uh, usually had a like, particular set of characteristics. Like they were, um, you know, uh, they stood up straight, they had broad shoulders, they were brave, they had a certain personality, a certain disposition. In other words, some people were born to be soldiers, like good soldiers, and some people just weren't. And so you kind of had, you know, some people were just kind of born that way. And yeah, they could be improved and trained, but ultimately you kind of had to have something, you know, uh, there had to be something there in the first place. That's the way we used to view the army and soldiers. How do you think we view soldiers now? So we used to think that soldiers were born. Now we think what? Cisco. That they're made. Anyone can like go to boot camp and be turned into a soldier. Precisely. The view now is very different. We used to think that soldiers are born. Now, however, we recognize, no, 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 no. Soldiers are not born. Soldiers are made. Uh, the Marine Corps, for one example, can take literally anybody and they turn you into a Marine. As long as you obey their orders, you know, you listen to what they have to say, uh, they will turn you into a Marine. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, as long as you obey their training and you listen to them, they will turn you into a Marine machine. Uh, and so the idea is you are molded into what they want you to be. I want to show you an example from a movie. Uh, has anyone seen Full Metal Jacket by Stanley Kubrick? Uh, it's the same guy who directed uh, The Shining. Yeah. A couple of you? Okay. I want to show you a short clip from it. Uh, it's, um, so, so basically the, the, the movie, it, it's a Vietnam War movie. Uh, the movie's kind of split into two parts. 
the first half of the movie is about the these soldiers in boot camp in a marine boot camp and the second half of the movie is them actually in vietnam and so uh, I just want to show you a clip from the first half where uh, they just are being introduced to their drill sergeant, who's this very brutal, very rude, uh, very condescending man. And the actor that they got to play him, uh, you can see in the picture there, the actor they got to play him was actually a drill sergeant in real life. And so um, Stanley Kubrick just asked him, like, you know, the director, hey, can you just kind of like do what you would normally do with like, you know, a group of new soldiers? And uh, he did. So I'm going to share, I'm going to stop the, um, this for a second. I'm going to go ahead and post a link to the video uh, because I, I realized I probably could play it through Zoom, but because I plan on um, posting this onto YouTube and they're really weird about copyright, uh, yeah, I'm just going to post the link and I'll give you five minutes to uh, to watch it. Uh, warning, uh, there is a lot of profanity, like a lot of cursing. Uh, if you've seen this film, there's a lot of cursing, but it does a good job of demonstrating what I want to demonstrate. So, uh, yeah, I'm just warning. There's no, there's no violence. Like it's not gory or anything. It's just there's a lot of cursing. Okay, so you guys ready? Okay, so here's the link. Send it private pile. Oh shit. <laughs> Goodness. All right, so go ahead and click the link. Watch it on YouTube, and we'll rendezvous in cinco minutos. Sound good? napping my kids so um i'm just doing the best i can and so i just expect the same of you and that does mean um like okay um uh, so sorry i'm on here i want you to for dr i mean present. miss edmund um, i what i'd like to do today i'm going to show you some
<clears throat> Are we done? All right. Pretty intense, yes? <laughs> Goodness. Uh, yeah, it, it's a great movie, honestly. If you, if you guys have some time to watch it, I would highly recommend it. It's pretty intense. I mean, that's just Kubrick style. Um, okay, so if everyone's ready, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, so moving on to the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Okay, how does that movie clip from Full Metal Jacket illustrates Foucault's point about docile bodies? I mean, it should be pretty obvious, but let's just make it explicit. Um, so yeah, go ahead and raise your hand. Either an opinion about the, about the clip uh, itself or, um, or, uh, or, or just how it connects to Foucault. What do you guys think? Oh, it's so awkward. Oh my God, someone say something, please. How does this movie clip illustrate Foucault's point about docile bodies? Jaden, go for it. Oh, so uh, basically, like, they don't have any, uh, like, uh, what's the word? Like, control over uh, any aspects of their lives. Like, it's basically in the hands of the drill sergeant. And, like, they're acting on his time, on his definition of what they should do. Like, Joker tries to like uh, step outside of his rules and he's immediately punished for it and so it's like there's a whole system set up by them and they have like no freedom within it. That's right I mean precisely uh, the whole point is to restrict their freedom I mean they have to stand a certain way they have to like you know speak a certain way they have to be if you watch the rest of the movie you know the rest of boot camp is, is pretty brutal too I mean everything boils down to one word discipline uh what do you guys think i mean the, the the dialogue is pretty infamous uh and i think as far as i understand there actually wasn't a script uh that, that guy just literally just started mouthing off things that he would normally say to fresh recruits yeah. it gets worse yeah yeah it, it gets way worse and even more abusive um and in particular when he starts to see someone as like defective uh it gets pretty bad yeah good movie good movie uh, what, what, what do you guys think? You can just give me an opinion about that clip uh, either. It doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, like, what do what, you guys think about it? I just wanted to, do you see me? <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. Uh, wait, I, I don't It's Sophia. Oh, Sophia, Sophia, there, there, there's a function to raise your hand under. Um, oh, I was just raising my hand on the screen. No, because I, I have everything, because there's, there's a lot of participants, so I have everything kind of minimized. Okay. Sophia, Wait, how, do raise my, how do I raise my hand? Uh, if you go to participants, there should be an option. Uh, okay. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Okay, well, I was gonna say, like, especially when he was saying, you're probably not gonna like me, but uh, you're gonna learn a lot and, and that stuff. Um, I don't know, I, I just thought a lot about Mr. Butler and, <laughs> <laughs> and how, like, effective it really is that like if you really are that mean to them and like and have that force and like um just that kind of attitude like it does work and like you do have like that control over over them like you literally scare them to do what you need them to do and learn and like I learned a lot in Mr. Butler like more than I've ever learned in the math class and like it's literally because I was scared not to learn <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, the old uh, political philosopher um, Niccolo Machiavelli once famously said, uh, it is better to be feared than to be loved. Uh, and in that, you know, in that way, I'm sure a lot of teachers might kind of remind you of this sort of like old school method of, uh, yeah, instilling fear in a classroom. I remember that's the way Mr. Lin used to teach too. Like everything was just so, you know, scary about him. Like, you know, he, he, he'd yell at you if you got something wrong or if you fucked up in some way. Uh, and, and yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, that, that, that's, that is, and has been proven to be an effective means of maintaining control. Um, and okay, yeah, so no, th th thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, any other uh, insights or any comments you had on uh, the clip from Full Metal Jacket? Anybody else? No, we kind of, did we say everything we needed to say? Okay, I see Cisco's thumbs up, thank you. <laughs> Oh, you guys know you have those little uh, those little uh, emojis, right? There's only like two. There's like the the, the thumbs up and the yeah. <laughs> Wait, you you guys don't do that anymore, right? The uh, when you clap between every word for emphasis, is that still a thing? Is that still a thing? You guys are muted. I can't hear you. Although I can see Jaden laughing. <laughs> Just checking. Oh my gosh. 
Okay. <clears throat> All right. In that case, let's move on. Okay, I want to read one little uh, thing with you guys. If you guys could turn to page 19. We're actually almost done for today. Just a couple more slides I want to go over. But if you guys could turn to page 19 uh, in the reading. Um, if you haven't already done so, I would really recommend downloading the uh, PDF from uh, Schoology, just so you have it on your computer um, um, more, uh, more permanently. But I'd just like to read one little passage at the bottom of page 19. Uh, are you guys uh, with me? You guys got it? Okay, well, I, I, I can't hear or see several of you. Okay, Sydney, thumbs up, thank you, yes. Everybody else? Okay, Tiffany, good. Jessica, good. Jaden, good. Tiffany, good. Yes, everyone else? Hannah's good, all right, cool. Okay, so at the bottom of page 19, I'll go ahead and narrate. <clears throat> so we're going from the example of armies to the example of schools. Modern armies like to recruit individuals when they are young when they are most impressionable and then build their skills over time. I mean, that's not a secret. But school is probably the area where age grouping has had the widest influence in society. Put yourself into the school that Foucault describes in the following passage. So this is Foucault now. From the, from the 17th century to the introduction, at the beginning of the 19th of the so-called Lancaster method, the complex clockwork of the mutual improvement school was built up cog by cog. First, the oldest pupils were entrusted with tasks involving simple supervision, then of checking work, then of teaching. The school became a machine for learning. Okay, and when you think about it, this method is still employed in school. Many of you are TAs. Who here is a TA for either an office or a teacher? Okay, yeah, several of you, several of you. And so you, you don't think it's weird that like only seniors and on very rare cases, juniors are allowed to be TAs? The older kids are the TAs. And so you help teachers uh, organize papers, grade papers. Uh, oh, if, if you're in um, the period five class with uh, Ms. Dilsey, the, the college bound class, I mean, that quite literally it falls within this model as well, where you have older students helping to take care and educate the younger students. And what's your primary goal? It's to try and maintain discipline. Uh, by helping a teacher grade or helping, you know, keeping a class in line, you are further contributing to turning kids into machines. The Marines attempts to turn you into a Marine machine. Corps attempts to turn you into a Corps machine. And sometimes it does a really, really good job. In fact, I think Corps has a very successful track record for that. Uh, and I think the mark of success is uh, how many of us come back to teach. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Uh, I think half of our faculty are former students. Um, I'm a former student, um, Mr. Saavedra, uh, uh, Ms. Del Pino, Dr. Williams, uh, uh, Mr. Kim, uh, uh, Ms. Enman, uh, Mr. Silva. Um, let's see, Basinger it was not in core, but his wife was, and so was Mr. Leconte's wife. So they're like core in-laws. Uh, and uh, let's see, oh, I feel like I'm missing somebody. Whatever, it'll come back to me. But but uh, I think like half of us, like fully half of us are former students. And so the idea is that, you know, there's a particular kind of like, you know, thing when it comes to a core kid and like, you know, a particular kind of person. And obviously your core teachers exemplify that most of all. And so it's not a coincidence. Uh, I wonder who's gonna come back and teach from your class. <laughs> Ashton. Ashton. Oh, maybe, actually, maybe. It's gonna be Ashton. That boy. Oh, if you can calm down a little bit, maybe it'll be him. <laughs> Do you think you're calm? When I, when I was, I mean, yeah, I'm pretty calm. Yeah, but, I mean, your classroom, I mean, Ashton could bring the energy, don't you think? The PowerPoints, even oh, more yeah. crazy. <laughs> I, see, I see Ashton doing dumb things, too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm very happy I still have a job over some of the things. <laughs> Oh, good times. Anyway, so uh, yeah, but I want you to think about like the purpose of school is to turn you into a machine. Um, now, continuing on, because there's one more thing I want to go over. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to read the next little part. In a school of 360 children, the master would not be able to give half a minute each. By the new method, each of the 360 pupils, writers, reads, or counts for two and a half hours. This carefully measured combination of forces requires a precise system of command. All the activity of the disciplined individual must be punctuated and sustained by commands that must trigger off the required behavior. Place the body in a wor little world of signals, bells, clapping of hands, gestures, a mere glance from the teacher. At the word enter, 
the students bring in their right hands down the table with a resounding thud at the same time, put one leg onto the bench, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, Foucault is a big critic of like all this big discipline, but I wanna go ahead and sort of criticize, you know, go against Foucault for a second. A lot of the reason why institutions like a school act in this way is purely for practical purposes. Guys, I have, uh, so me personally, I have over 200 students this year. You know, I, I teach the entirety of 12th grade core. I do not have the time of day to devote a huge amount of time to every single one of you equally. So what I have to do is I have to determine like, okay, some of you need more attention than others. Some of you need more help than others. Uh, I have to determine that really quickly. And I have to have methods of being able to keep a classroom under control. And so the problem is like, okay, do you guys know what the single biggest aspect is of student achievement? Like the single biggest factor that goes into, this is worldwide too, this isn't just in the United States. It's widely been shown the single biggest factor that determines student success is actually not socioeconomic in income, it's not ethnicity, it's none of that. The single biggest indicator of success is classroom size. Smaller classroom sizes directly translate to better achievement for students. Why? Well, it's, it's simple because a teacher can direct much more direct attention to specific students. So if we had a class of like 10, 15 kids, then yeah, obviously we'd have a, an opportunity to establish a more intimate relationship, a more, um, you know, a, a, like, you know, closer, like a question answering. It, it'd be more of like a, an apprenticeship than like, you know, you being in a class. Um, Jaden? Um, would you argue that like, in relation, it's kind of um, like a part, like a measure of student achievement is like ability to be like independent like not having to like be watched over mm -hmm. like an apprenticeship like the ability to work within um like this system that we have like a big class watched or helped constantly yeah absolutely i mean when once a student can can like do things more on their own when they have their, their own like self-motivation their own curiosity that's the ideal but that's easier to do when you have a smaller classroom size because then you can check in with them easier. I mean, this class, I mean, not everyone is here and how many participants do we have in this chat alone? Like we have like what, like 28? Yeah, like 28. And so, um, or 24. But uh, yeah, I, smaller classroom sizes make it easier for teachers to like, you know, help students. Um, but because we have such big schools and we have such big classes, it's just not possible or practical for teachers to give you individualized attention. And so it's easier and more practical to just treat everyone the same way, like a machine. I mean, you guys have been in classes of like 40, 50, 60 kids, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, and, and, and when you go to college, you might get, get into some lecture halls that are like 100 kids. Um, and it's, it's just not possible for the teacher or the professor to, you know, give you individualized attention. Uh, Jaden, go ahead. Sorry, just really quick, just like to play devil's advocate for a sec. Um, then why do like places with lower population, like like LA is like one of the most populated like cities in the in the country, and it's like education rates are pretty high, like compared to somewhere like I don't know like Missouri or something where the population is lower, but like their education rates are lower as well. Uh, less teachers. So because uh, it's also it's it's increasing number of students and less teachers. Uh, and so LUSD has uh, a lot of students, but we also have a proportionally large number of teachers compared to other parts in the country. But let's say a, rural, a really rural place in like, you know, Missouri. Um, mm -hmm. In our society, people are not incentivized to become teachers in the same way as they would other professionals because it doesn't pay well. Like the, the amount of education a teacher has to receive in order to become a teacher um, is equivalent to like, like you would be making so much more money as like an engineer or a lawyer or uh, something else that will also require a lot of education. And so people just aren't incentivized to want to teach. And so there's less teachers that it translates to bigger classrooms. Gotcha. Cool. That's a good question. Okay. So I just wanted to point that out to you and, and especially in the way that it might relate to, um, to you. Okay, so the conclusion that we reach and with Foucault is that you are a machine, at least you're treated like one. You are molded, shaped, programmed by your modern institutions to behave a very particular way to achieve very specific goals. In core, we attempt to turn you into a particular kind of machine, a, um, a socially conscious machine, a, 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 an essay writing machine, a, a college attending machine. 
there are certain behaviors that colleges expect that we are drilling into you right now. I mean, hell, even with all this online class, like, you know, expect it to happen uh, more frequently in the future. And so in a sense, we're trying to drill you and, and discipline you to act a certain way. And I want to let you know, those institutions, your schools, your, your churches, your government, they have gotten very good at treating you like a machine and molding you into the kind of person that they want you to be. In other words, the first step is to turn you into a docile body. I guess the one thing I'll say, one more thing I'll say about this is um, when you think about any institution, let's take, uh, and we're going to talk a lot more about this later, social media, <laughs> your, uh, your Instagram, your, uh, your, your TikTok. Do you guys still use Snapchat? Or is that like lame now? It's still there, definitely. It's still there? Okay. So when you guys go on social media, you are, you are quite literally pacified. Uh, it's the same reason why like parents tend to give like their kids like phones like oh just play on this and leave me alone and so it pacifies you because when you're browsing social media when you're on your phone you're probably sitting somewhere or you're probably lying in bed somewhere and Foucault would say that that's what keeps you docile it's what makes you less likely to critically think and it makes you less likely to rebel against the system that you're in or try to change the system that you're in it quite literally keeps you docile for those, oh, and I'm so sorry, I probably should have said this at the beginning, but docile is a word that means like pacified, like uh, weak, uh, you know, submissive. That's what it means to be docile. And so your body is controlled by the things around you. And Mr. Silva is going to go into this in more detail, especially with your phones and social media. But in a lot of ways, you don't control social media. Social media controls you. And, uh, I, and I know now, especially because we don't have a lot, we don't have access to a lot of human co contact, a lot of you on your phones probably more. Uh, anyone have that like weekly report of, of like how much you're on your phone? Yeah, it probably skyrocketed for a lot of you, right? The past couple of weeks, yeah, yeah. Me too, because you know, we, 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 we want human interaction, but, but we don't, uh, we're not getting it. But I want you to really strongly consider the role that social media plays in your life, and in particular, the way it makes your body super docile. Okay, so quick review of today, what we went over. Uh, we started by reviewing discussion board number nine, that was the which is more humane public execution or timetable. Then we went over a very brief thought experiment, spoil breath. It's actually today's uh, discussion board, so hopefully you can give a good, adequate answer to that. Uh, then we went over what a docile body means and uh, the machine, you know, the example with the army, uh, full metal jacket. And we are going to be going over the techniques of discipline in the weeks to come. So today was docile body, so we can struck that off. Uh, next lesson will be the means of correct training. After that will be panopticism. And finally, we'll conclude Foucault with discussion of the other. Sound good? All right, well, thank you so much for uh, tuning in to today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I will go ahead and stop recording in just a second. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, stop sharing. Okay, so thank you for attending the lecture. I will see you guys uh, later. Hold on, hold on.